Hi, it's Katrina. Tens of thousands of bodies. London is a city steeped in history, with layers upon layers of past buildings and artifacts sitting beneath the ground that people walk on every day without a second thought. That is, until a new discovery is made. In 2018, construction was set to begin near Euston train station to make room for the construction of a new high-speed rail line. A mandatory archaeological survey revealed a shocking discovery. There were around 40,000 bodies in a 118,000 square foot area. Senior osteologist Mike Henderson said that it was likely the largest ever archaeological excavation of bodies ever undertaken in the country. Situated beneath St. James Gardens, the sprawling property served as a cemetery between 1788 and 1853. Many of the graves contained remarkably well-preserved coffins and bodies, thanks to the large amount of clay in the ground, which prevented water damage. Discoveries like this help researchers learn more about daily life during one of London's most significant historical periods, according to Henderson, who explained that having such a large data set to glean information from could be important when it comes to things like mortality rates and diseases of the time. The team found evidence of tuberculosis, broken bones, and other traumatic injuries, and dental procedures, including dentures and surgeries, like skulls with saw marks. 2020 may have been bad, but you do not want surgery in the 1800s. As with many large construction projects, the rail project proved controversial because it required the demolition of hundreds of homes, but it proved valuable for archaeology and history. Pregnant Mummy Researchers were taking a look at an Egyptian sarcophagus with inscriptions suggesting that there was a male priest inside. However, when they scanned the mummy, they got quite the shock. It wasn't a man at all, but a pregnant woman. It is the first discovery of a mummified pregnant woman ever, with even her soft tissue still preserved. The team of archaeologists examined it as part of the Warsaw Mummy Project. They were looking for signs of ancient diseases and causes of death when they discovered that the person described on the coffin was someone entirely different than who it contained. Donated to the University of Warsaw in 1826, the mummy somehow evaded close investigation until recently, when the researchers performed X-ray and CT scans of what they thought were the remains of a priest named Hor Jehuti from ancient Thebes. This was most certainly not him. Measurements of the fetus's head suggest that the woman was between six and a half and seven and a half months pregnant when she died, between the ages of 20 and 30 years old during the first century BC. The mummy's abdominal cavity is filled with four bundles that likely contain her lungs, liver, stomach, intestine, and heart, which were extracted, embalmed, and put back inside her according to ancient Egyptian burial customs. But the fetus was still in her womb, untouched, leading the team to believe that the culture saw unborn babies as part of their mother rather than as individuals deserving of their own afterlives. The quality of the embalming indicates that she was of a high social status. While it's unknown why the mummy was inside a man's coffin, mismatches like this are known to happen and likely resulted from looting and illegal excavations. Damage to the woman's neck suggests that grave robbers yanked valuable jewelry and amulets before selling her to someone. The cause of death is unknown, but it was common for women to die during pregnancy and childbirth during ancient times, indicating that her pregnancy likely played a role. The team is going to analyze small samples of blood to see if they can find out more. Beheaded Earl's Ring while searching for treasure late last year on the Isle of Man, a small island situated between Ireland and Great Britain, metal detectorist Lee Morgan found a 370-year-old gold and crystal ring bearing the letters JD or ID. Dating back to the late 1600s, the slender Stuart period ring may have been crafted in honor of an earl who lived and died during the English Civil War. If the letters are JD, the jewelry was perhaps the property of James Stanley, 7th Earl of Derby and Lord of Man, who signed his name as James Derby, hence the initials. The ring's high quality is a good indicator that it was created for someone wealthy, according to Alison Fox, curator of archaeology at Manx National Heritage. Stanley's widow, Charlotte, likely had it made in his honor. Also known as Baron Strange and the Great Earl of Derby, James Stanley was a royalist who supported King Charles I, an authoritarian monarch who ruled over England, Scotland, and Ireland from 1625 to 1649. 
The king's tyrannical ways did not vibe well with English Parliament, and in 1642 the animosity between the two erupted into the English Civil War. Charles I's reign ended with his execution. James Stanley was executed two years later in 1651. A plaque stands in his honor today in the town of Bolton in Manchester, near the site where he was put to death. Although Morgan was seeking treasure when he found the ring, actually finding it is rare, making it a surprising discovery. And while the ring itself may not be that creepy, knowing it might have commemorated a decapitated Earl certainly adds eerie overtones to it. Would you wear it? Let me know in the comments below. Ancient Burial Mound in 2006, a group of kindergartners scared adults half to death when they started pulling up human bones and playing with them. They were on their school playground in France when they unintentionally dug up bits of human bone. A closer look by experts revealed that the school was built on top of a large ancient burial mound dating back thousands of years. But nobody knew just how old the human remains were until a 2019 study of the burial mound determined that the site is much older than originally thought. The oldest remains date back 5,600 years, and the dead were placed there for a 2,000-year period, starting in 3600 BC during the late Neolithic era and ending during the Iron Age, around 1250 BC. A team of archaeologists excavated at least 30 bodies, including 20 adults and 10 children, who were buried just 1.6 feet in the ground. They also unearthed a plethora of grave goods, including broken ceramics, metal, and animal bones. While the researchers made some headway in determining how old the site is and how long it was used for, they failed to figure out why it was a chosen burial site for the prehistoric local population. As lead study author Hannah James said in a statement, it's not particularly prestigious or significant in any way. It's not located on a hill or any other obvious location, yet people return to it time and time again to lay their their dead to rest. The people buried at the site are also a mystery to experts, who determined through dental analysis that most of the dead were locals and that they sourced their food from the land rather than by fishing in a nearby river or in the Atlantic Ocean. Skull Ring While metal detecting in Wales, David Balfour encountered a gold ring decorated with a skull made from white enamel, with the surrounding inscription Memento Mori, a Latin phrase that translates to, remember that you have to die. This ring would probably still be popular today. South Wales Central Senior Coroner officially classified the spooky jewelry as treasure, a designation that makes them the property of the UK government. Based on its style, shape, and script, the ring was likely crafted between 1550 and 1650, during either the Tudor or early Stuart periods according to Mark Redknapp of the National Museum of Wales, who said in a statement that the rare piece symbolizes the high mortality of the time, as well as the vanity and brevity of life. It likely belonged to an elite member of society. The Memento Mori theme was common in artwork at certain points in history. While these types of artifacts tend to strike us as morbid, they were more or less intended as an optimistic reminder to make the most of one's fragile and short time on Earth. You know, seize the day and all that. The ring was examined along with a trove of other recently discovered, less creepy Welsh artifacts, including three hordes of gold and silver coins, gold and silver jewelry, and personal accessories dating back between the 9th and 17th centuries. Backyard Burials While digging a drainage hole for a patio being built in a family's backyard in the village of Hatesbury, England recently, a work crew stumbled upon human remains. Robbie Kearney, the builder who made the discovery, initially thought he had found some animal bones. But when he dug deeper and found a human skull, he and his co-workers immediately stopped what they were doing and notified the property owner of their gruesome discovery. Homeowners Matthew and Amelia Jackson called the police, who dispatched a crime scene crew, including forensic officers and an archaeologist, to the site. In an interview with The Mirror, Mr. Jackson said that the experts determined that these skeletons are not likely to be recent, and that they possibly date back to the 5th century, during the early medieval period. Found just 300 feet from the 12th century church of St. Peter and St. Paul, the bones are probably from a plague pit, one of many that are rumored to be in the town, according to the local historian. Sam Fox of Wiltshire Council explained that the graves appear to be Christian and contain the remains of both females and males of varying ages. The bones were sent away for radiocarbon dating to determine their precise age. After that, they will be respectfully reburied. Ancient Child's Toys 
Some of the oldest toys known to exist in the world were discovered in 2017 in the Republic of Caucasia in southern Siberia. Found in the grave of a child from the prehistoric Okunev culture at the Itkol II burial grounds, the finds included the heads of an ancient doll and a figurine of an unidentified creature resembling a horse. Dating back roughly 4,500 years, the toys' bodies were made from organic material which wore away before they were unearthed. Measuring just two inches high and carved from a soft talc-based rock called soapstone, the doll head contains what archaeologist Andrei Polikov described as carefully worked out facial features. The animal head was carved from antler or horn, and it's unclear what creature it represents. Archaeologists are unsure what the toy's specific purpose was, but clarified that the artifacts came from the grave of a commoner rather than a child from an elite background. Other Okunev toys have been found in the past, including a figurine of a pagan god and ghoulish figurines that doubled as rattles, making them the oldest known baby rattles ever found. Thought to have ancient links with Native Americans, the Okunev culture's presence in Siberia dates back to the second millennium BC. It's believed that the ancestors of the diverse and artistically rich group were among the travelers who crossed into North America via the Bering Land Bridge around 12,600 years ago. Evidence suggests that the Okunev originally came north to Siberia from what is now Kazakhstan, further suggesting that Native Americans could have genetic roots in that region. Deformed Alien Skulls During the Roman collapse in the 5th century, the empire swiftly abandoned its Pannonian territories in what is now western Hungary as the conquering Huns invaded central Europe. Meanwhile, foreign groups went to Pannonia seeking refuge and joined the local Romanized settlements. These rapidly changing population dynamics resulted in a cultural shift that modern experts are still trying to fully understand. Since 1961, dozens of deformed skulls have been unearthed at an ancient graveyard in Mot Itse Dulo. Out of 96 burials, 51 bore evidence of a practice called skull binding, which involves artificially stretching a person's head by tightly wrapping it during childhood, permanently altering it to resemble what some liken to an alien-like appearance. Dating back to the Paleolithic era, this tradition of extreme body modification spread across Central Asia during the 2nd century BC and into Europe shortly thereafter, according to lead study author. The graves at this place represent three distinct groups of people and span three generations generations from around 430 AD to 470 AD, when the site was abandoned. An isotope analysis of their bones revealed that some of the individuals from later burials were from the immediate area and had lived there under the Romans, while others migrated there after being displaced from other regions. While these groups had noticeably different burial customs, all three practiced skull binding, reflecting its spread across cultures. They used different skull binding techniques further suggesting that it was one of several cultural practices that were exchanged between the groups as they adjusted to living in a shared community. Did you know that there were these types of skulls in Hungary? Mass Grave of Children In mid-2020, workers in southeastern Poland dug up human bones while working on a roadway and summoned a team of archaeologists who made what they described as a frightening discovery of a mass 17th-century burial of at least 119 graves belonging mostly to children. Found in the village of Jehove, the youths were buried with coins in their mouths as part of a pre-Christian tradition called Obols of the Dead, or Charon's Obol, which lasted well into Christian times. The coins were placed in the mouths of the dead as payments to Charon, the mythical ferryman who carried the souls of the newly deceased across a river separating the land of the living from the land of the dead. Some of the coins date back to the reign of Sigismund III Vasa, who was king of Poland from 1587 to 1632. Other coins were minted between 1648 and 1668 during the reign of John II Casimir. The absence of grave goods indicates that the deceased came from a very poor community. Olasek said that based on the arrangement of the burials, the cemetery is undoubtedly Catholic in nature and that the graves were well cared for. Between 70 and 80 percent of the individuals found were children, possibly reflecting the high child mortality rate of the time. The cemetery's presence confirms long-standing local rumors of a nearby children's graveyard. After being exhumed and studied, the remains will be reburied. The Mothman one of the most horrifying things ever discovered near Chernobyl had nothing to do with the actual meltdown of the nuclear reactor. Instead, what Chernobyl staff saw just before the deadly explosion that became one of the worst nuclear disasters in the history of humanity 
was a monster. Not just any monster, either. Before the explosion rocked Ukraine, witnesses saw a creature flying through the sky described as being some kind of freak of nature. The beast had glowing red eyes. It seemed to be completely black, and it had wings so large there is no way it could have been an eagle or a giant bat. It's become known as the Black Bird of Chernobyl, though many people claim it was really the infamous Mothman from West Virginia legend. You're probably wondering how on earth the legendary Mothman could have showed up to a small Ukrainian village hosting a nuclear reactor all the way from Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Well, if you know anything about the Mothman legends, you'll know that the Mothman is always a warning of impending doom. Whenever the Mothman is seen, a catastrophic event almost always comes immediately after, just like the collapse of the Silver Bridge in December of 1967 that killed 46 people, shortly after the Mothman was seen flying around. Unfortunately, the only proof that what workers saw was real is a blurry photograph of what appears to be a black creature with spindly legs and long, almost angel-like wings flying overhead in the dark. Since the Chernobyl incident, the Mothman has yet to be seen again. Mutant Wolves In a shocking new study of wolves around Chernobyl, specifically in the radiated exclusion zone, Researchers have discovered that the animals could be spreading mutations caused by radiation to other populations of European wolves. According to the report from National Geographic, researchers tracked and studied 13 wolves using specialized collars for measuring radiation. They found a few expected results. First, the wolves experienced a burst of radiation when traveling through contaminated areas. However, they found that one of the young male wolves trekked for 250 miles through Belarus and into Russia, likely in search of a mate after being contaminated. Here's where the danger comes in. Michael Byrne from the University of Missouri, who studies animal movements, says that because the wolf population in the exclusion zone is so high, it makes sense that young animals will disperse. But if the wolves mutate and they breed with wolves from outside of the exclusion zone, they could transfer unhealthy mutations to the next generation of wolves. Not only that, but they also have the ability to contaminate uncontaminated areas with their radiation. It's hard to really understand what all of this means. Nobody knows exactly to what extent these radioactive mutations will reach. We know that radiation in wolves can cause tumors, extra small brains, and developmental abnormalities. If gone unchecked, some are wondering if the mutations could spread and ultimately wipe out all the European wolves, or maybe even turn them into eerie mutants running through the forest. The Radioactive Elephant Deep in the heart of Chernobyl is a radioactive elephant. More specifically, it's a radioactive elephant's foot. Elephant's foot is the nickname given to a huge chunk of radioactive material beneath the nuclear power plant at Chernobyl. It was discovered in December of 1986 in the remains of reactor number four after it exploded. Out of everything in the plant and the surrounding area, the elephant's foot is to this day still the most radioactive thing around. The elephant's foot is also special because its radioactivity has not decreased that much since the original disaster. But what is this thing made out of? It's comprised primarily of silicon dioxide, though the clump is also packed with traces of uranium, magnesium, and graphite. All of these things combined create some serious radioactivity. The mass was solid after the explosion and couldn't even be damaged by a remotely operated drill. It didn't start to crack until 1998, and in 2021, the mass had melted to become almost like sand. Now here's how lethal the elephant's foot is. Eight months after it was formed, the radioactivity while standing close to the mass was 8,000 röntgens. What this means is that you were given a fatal dose of radiation in just five minutes. And even though it's gotten less dangerous over the years, it is still able to kill a person if they linger too close for too long. Giant Catfish Besides wolves, there are giant catfish prowling the cooling pond near the Chernobyl power plant. The cooling pond was used to keep the reactors from overheating. Today, there isn't much use for the cooling pool since the power plant's not really functioning anymore. However, the cooling plant is filled with fish of enormous proportions. Some of these fish are monsters, much larger than average. But what you might not believe is that radiation has nothing to do with the preposterous size of these huge catfish. 
What a lot of people don't realize is that radiation doesn't usually mutate things to become giant versions of themselves. At least, that's what University of South Carolina radiation specialist Timothy Moso says. He says that instead of growing to be gigantic, animals that are mutated instead become less efficient. This means they have a harder time catching food, getting from place to place, and breeding. This lack of efficiency almost always leads to the animal dying because it can no longer compete in a world of predators and prey. Mutations aren't nearly as glamorous as you see in video games and movies, and animals don't really get any cool superpowers. The truth is significantly more disturbing and uglier. The catfish living in the Chernobyl cooling pond are natural giants. These are Wells catfish and can already grow to giant proportions, with some of the biggest Wells catfish growing to be over 350 pounds. There isn't anything radioactive about them. The question is, how did they get there in the first place? And how did they survive? A hovering UFO. After the Chernobyl disaster on April 26, 1986, tons of radioactive byproduct went flying into the atmosphere. It was a calamity, but apparently some in the area witnessed what they described as an unidentified flying object, perhaps an alien ship, flying over the plant shortly after the explosion. Some believe that the UFO may have caused the nuclear reactor to explode on purpose as part of some kind of cosmic experiment being performed on humans. There is no way to possibly verify this. However, there have been unsubstantiated claims that people who were radiated at Chernobyl are giving birth to children who have a strange yellow fluid inside of their body instead of blood. They say that within just a handful of generations, the offspring of these yellow-blooded mutants will be smarter than Einstein. This, of course, is an urban legend. Unfortunately, seeing as Chernobyl exploded in 1986, nobody really had a smartphone handy to snap pictures of the alleged UFO in the sky. Since then, all talk of aliens being involved with the worst nuclear disaster in history have all but been wiped under the rug. Anyone who believes that people really did see UFOs outside Chernobyl has been deemed a crackpot and a conspiracy theorist. But the truth is that there have been enough witnesses to grant at least the possibility of something strange being in the sky that day, whether alien, government, or maybe something else. Radioactive Hotspots the Red Forest of Chernobyl is one of the most radioactive places on the planet. Recently, researchers from the United Kingdom working with the University of Bristol traveled to the exclusion zone and then used special drones to go deep into the most radiated parts of the forest to measure gamma radiation and neutrons. These drones are known as Unmanned Aerial Vehicles, or UAV for short. It was an attempt to map the Red Forest and see just how truly radiated it still is all these years later. What they found were additional radioactive hotspots previously unknown to Ukrainian authorities, according to the University of Bristol. The Red Forest covers an area of about four square miles. The forest originally earned its name when the radiation turned the trees a terrifying reddish-brown color. Instead of being green and vivid, the vegetation here is red and not thriving very well. The drone began eight miles from the epicenter of the explosion in a small village located at the edge of the exclusion zone. They then moved the drone inward, searching through the forest during a 10-day survey with a total of 24 hours in the air. The deeper into the forest, the more radiation they detected. The university will now share the information about the hot zones they discovered with local authorities to help keep people out of the woods and from turning into mutants. Mysterious Otter one of the strangest things recently spotted in the forests of Chernobyl was an unlikely animal. This was not a monster or a mutant freak. Instead, it was a regular otter. The otter was discovered wandering through the radiated exclusion zone. Researchers trying to track wildlife through the area around Chernobyl to see how it's been recovering used hidden cameras. They used fish carcasses to bait the animals close to the shore where they had the cameras positioned and managed to capture on video 15 species of bird and mammals in the quarantine region. Everyone was shocked when an otter came out of nowhere and gobbled up one of the dead fish. This was the first time that researchers spotted such an animal inside the exclusion zone since humans left in 1986. Even more shocking is that the cameras also captured images of white-tailed eagles and American mink. It's unclear whether any of these animals are highly mutated or dangerous. It's not clear if there's a family of otters living nearby, but as far as anyone can tell, the animals seem perfectly healthy and not in the least bit affected. 
98% of the fish the researchers put out was eaten, which is a high rate of scavenging. The researchers were very excited and take this as a great sign that wildlife is now thriving. Birth Defects The most tragic thing that happened following the Chernobyl nuclear disaster has been a string of birth defects. The men and women who lost their lives trying to contain the nuclear disaster were very courageous and their loss was also tragic, but since 1986, physicians in the region have reported a spike in birth defects that is nothing short of heartbreaking. Many children in southern Belarus and northern Ukraine have been suffering congenital birth defects that leave them crippled and mangled for life. A study done by the American Academy of Pediatrics found a direct correlation between dangerous levels of strontium-90 and birth defects. Strontium-90 is of course a radioactive element produced thanks to nuclear fission. It's no surprise that such a volatile element would cause such harm. And while I'm not going to get into the specifics of the birth defects because it really is quite sad, there was another study done by UNICEF that has suggested at least 20% of adolescent children in the country of Belarus have been born with a serious disability because of a birth defect. As you can imagine, having 20% of children disabled because of a birth defect is a shocking number. It should be closer to the 0% mark, which really makes you wonder just how far the radiation went and for how much longer we will see its after effects. A horrifying new species. There has been a rumor going around that a disturbing new species of monster has been born from the radiation surrounding Chernobyl. Pictures of the monster have been uploaded online. It has black leathery skin, dark and evil eyes, and a face unlike anything you've ever seen before. It seems to be a very real monster that maybe lost all its hair because of all the dangerous radiation. It's more of an urban legend than an actual real creature. The so-called proof was an image of something else, but people are still afraid there is some sort of scary monster species roaming the forest. Other than some rumors and anecdotal reports of creatures, no mutant werewolves or night monsters have been found in the woods outside Chernobyl. The picture that has been going around describing the creature is actually an Andean bear who goes by the name of Dolores. Dolores and a few other bears came from the Andean mountains of South America after being discovered suffering from some kind of strange hairless disorder. These bears didn't lose their hair because of radiation. It was something altogether different. Animals rule Chernobyl. The nuclear reactor at Chernobyl exploded over 30 years ago. Since then, people have not been living in the affected area. And while we know that there have certainly been some very terrifying birth defects in animals and humans, something else has come from all the turmoil. With a huge area around Chernobyl and Pripyat becoming uninhabitable for people, animals have moved in at astoundingly high levels. I've already told you about otters and wolves, but National Geographic says there are many more exotic species living in the area, such as brown bear, lynx, beaver, deer, owls, moose, foxes, and plenty of others, making it what scientists are calling a wildlife sanctuary. This is one of the rare times when humans have left some place indefinitely while it was still relatively normal. Sure, there's some radiation, but at the edges of the exclusion zone you would never know. The vegetation looks normal, there are still bugs and critters, and animals are thriving without any human intervention. The exclusion zone straddles the border of Ukraine and Belarus. Studies have shown that large mammals on the Belarusian side of the zone have increased dramatically since the explosion. During a short five-week survey, a team of scientists documented 21 boar, 60 raccoon dogs, 9 badgers, 26 gray wolves, and even a bison. One of the scientists said it was just incredible because you literally can't go anywhere without bumping into a wolf. Unfortunately, there aren't really any other places like the exclusion zone where animals can really be free from human interaction. Nature has risen from the ashes. New Mexico Mystery Stone the New Mexico Mystery Stone, also known as the Decalogue Stone, can be found on a mountain in a remote part of the desert deep in New Mexico. This mysterious stone has an inscription written on it in what some say is an extinct language. The reason that this particular discovery is so controversial is that nobody can agree on what the script on the stone says, or even exactly where it came from. Some say the language is Paleo-Hebrew, and others that it is Cypriotic Greek. Perhaps it is Phoenician, though there has yet to be any proof. The stone was discovered in the 1800s, but not properly documented until 1933 by the famous archaeologist Frank Hibben, who happened to be from New Mexico. 
Proponents that it is Paleo-Hebrew say that based on a translation by a Harvard scholar in 1949, it is a record of the Ten Commandments. In another scholar's translation using Cypriotic Greek, the inscription says that it is a report from a warrior from the Mediterranean named Zakineros, who is lost in the wilderness and is now struggling to survive. However, it could be that Hibben himself made it up in an attempt to try to demonstrate that there was contact between Europeans and Native American people way before Columbus. American Giants Across the United States, there are burial mounds and remnants of strange grave sites that some say belong to an ancient race of extinct giants. As you can imagine, this is a very controversial subject. The best place to start is at Cahokia. In the year 1100, it was the largest city anywhere north of Mexico. It's currently located in southern Illinois, very near the Mississippi River. The city was built only 50 years before it became the largest city in northern North America, and it was occupied up until the year 1400. At its peak, its population was up to 50,000 people, way bigger than London at the time. There were three major boroughs connected by waterways and walking trails all across the St. Louis area. It was an advanced civilization with organized urban planning and agriculture, as well as arts and culture. They abandoned the site when the climate started to change and their magnificent city was flooded. Depending on who you ask, the people who lived here were literal giants. The claim is that giant skeletons have been found buried inside the mounds at Cahokia. However, mainstream scientists absolutely refute any such discoveries. And this is made more frustrating by the fact that it's well known that the pioneers who first discovered Cahokia attributed its creation to people from across the ocean, instead of giving the Native American people here the credit for building it. From an archaeological standpoint, Cahokia is one hot mess. The giant skeletons apparently turned to dust when they were taken from their graves. Some even claim the Smithsonian covered up their existence. There were many mistakes and errors when the first excavation started, and very little respect for the site. Now it's been a task for more modern researchers to piece together what happened and perform more organized and serious excavations at the site. The Holy Nail Archaeologists in the Czech Republic allegedly discovered a secret chamber beneath the floor of a monastery from the 12th century. Within the secret chamber, they found an ancient box with a gold plate and the words Jesus is King inscribed upon them. When they opened the box, they discovered a single nail inside, about six inches long. The immediate reaction was that the nail had been used in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ when he was nailed to the cross. The discovery comes from the South Bohemian region in the small town of Milevsko. Historians know the region has been inhabited throughout most of human history, all the way through the Bronze Age and Iron Age at least. The place was settled by the Slavs in the 8th century. The monastery was built in 1187 and later destroyed in 1420 by an attack from the Hussites. It's believed that when the Hussite warriors attacked, a lot of precious Christian artifacts were hidden beneath the monastery in the secret chamber to protect them. One of those artifacts is apparently the holiest nail in the world. But researchers do have more to go on than just the inscription. The box was carbon dated and they found it was constructed with larch wood taken from Israel, dating back to about 1290, and also from oak wood from as early as 260. These dates add up with the story. When asked why the secret chamber remained a secret for over 600 years, the discovery team simply told local news sources that after the Hussite invasion, there were no records left indicating the secret chamber even existed. Nobody knew it was there, so there was no reason to look. The Earliest Horsemen There is a big debate over who were the first people to start riding horses. The relationship between horses and humans is long. Dogs might be our best friend, but horses are a very close second. A new archaeological discovery out of Kazakhstan is shedding some light on this ancient mystery. Two horses were found inside of a tomb from the Bronze Age, and they have been dubbed the earliest evidence of horsemanship anywhere on Earth. The horses were buried on the banks of the Tobol River, inside an ancient cemetery hidden in the Eurasian steppes. There are about 30 other burial mounds in the area, all of them dating back to the Bronze Age. Radiocarbon dating placed the tomb complex at being used between 1890 and 1774 BC. This is fascinating because the earliest evidence of horse breeding only goes back to the year 2000 BC about 100 years before this burial. But who lived in Kazakhstan 4,000 years ago? It was the Petrovka people, sometimes known as the Andronovo culture. 
These were some of the first people in the world who raised horses for meat. However, now it seems like sometime after they started eating horses, they also started riding horses. The teeth from the horse skeletons showed evidence that they'd worn bridles with cheek pieces. There were even three pieces found buried with them. What this shows is that horsemanship was already alive and well during the Bronze Age. The people of the Eurasian steppe were already making equipment for horses and riding them, and even burying them alongside humans. It still doesn't give us a clue as to exactly when this began. Kensington Runestone The Kensington Runestone is an intriguing artifact first discovered in 1898. According to the Runestone Museum, where it's currently housed, it was found wrapped in the roots of an old aspen tree, discovered by a farmer about 15 miles from Alexandria in Minnesota. Ever since its discovery, researchers have been fighting over what it means, where it came from, and why an ancient runic artifact dated back to 1362 ended up in North America. The rune stone has also been the source of much controversy. After all, it's been over 100 years, and its authenticity is still in question. The slab of stone is about 200 pounds, with an inscription scrawled on the face of it. The inscription was allegedly left there by Scandinavian explorers from the 14th century. This, of course, would mean the Vikings had explored much more of North America than previously believed. It would seriously change the narrative surrounding the so-called discovery of North America. Unfortunately, the rune stone has been classified as a hoax ever since 1910. Some even say the guy who found it, a Swedish immigrant named Olaf Oman, crafted the stone himself to gain some notoriety in his community. Other scientists believe it's real. And this is the great big debate. Nobody can agree on whether the stone is real or a hoax. And so it's largely been discredited in all historical reports. Medieval Wife Swap Scientists have made a very strange discovery in a medieval religious book. Scientists working at Cambridge's Fitzwilliam Museum were checking out a medieval best-selling book called The Hours of Isabella Stewart, when they noticed one of the paintings inside the book had been altered. As it turns out, the author of the book had pulled off one of the oldest recorded wife swaps in the world. He replaced a painting of his first wife with a new painting of his second wife. And as you can imagine, considering this book was produced in the year 1431, swapping wives was a pretty controversial thing to do. The book itself was painted on vellum, either goat skin or cow skin. Researchers had to use infrared photographic technology to analyze the original pigments of the manuscript. What they found was that its author, Francis I of Brittany, had replaced his first wife, Yolande of Anjou, with his second wife. The original painting showed the first wife kneeling before the Virgin Mary. But then something happened. Maybe Francis killed his first wife, or maybe she died from the pox, and he replaced her with a new woman, literally painting over Yolande's face with the face of his second wife, who was named Isabella. And then the manuscript was altered again to make room for the first daughter of the new marriage. An extra page was added to show her painting. Skull 5 There was a skull discovered in the Republic of Georgia that has been dated back 1.8 million years. It's called Skull 5 and was excavated in 2005. But now, after studying the skull extensively for years, scientists have made a very controversial discovery that could rewrite human evolution as we know it, but it might rewrite evolution in a more simplistic manner. What scientists found is that all of the old distinct species of human, I'm talking about Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo floresiensis, may have come from a single lineage that evolved over time. What this means is that they weren't different species. They would have been the exact same breed of human, but they looked different depending on where in the world they lived, what food they ate, and how quickly they evolved. In other words, our own ancient ancestors would have been as different as a Scandinavian from an African, but both the same species, just like we're all the same species today, but look slightly different. The big question now is why didn't scientists see this before? It was probably because of the bones. Most of the ancient human bones found from various parts of the world have looked a bit different, and this has prompted scientists to label them all as different species. But according to the team of scientists who studied Skull 5, even though old hominids looked different and had different bones, they were still the same species that first originated in Africa. David and Goliath 
An ancient artifact that dates back 3,000 years may have revealed the history behind David and Goliath from the Bible. An archaeological dig near the biblical hometown of Goliath has shown evidence of religious practices dating back before the birth of Christ, pointing to a controversial historical connection between the stories of King David and the legendary story of King Solomon. The site of this ancient city is known today as Kirbet Kayafa. It's about 20 miles from Jerusalem and once stood near the Philistine city of Gath. The giant known as Goliath allegedly came out from Gath to face the Israelites, only to be defeated by David and his tiny sling. And while there is a huge amount of controversy surrounding the legitimacy of the David and Goliath story, and of course many stories written in the Bible, there have been recent artifacts that prove some aspects of the story are true. For example, there was evidence of a strong military force inside the city. There were also 3,000-year-old cult artifacts, including standing stones, altars, and shrines, and many sculptures made of clay that were likely used as inspiration for the description of Solomon's palace. In other words, the artifacts here reveal a story that may have been interpreted into the Bible. Some experts even believe David was simply a legendary figure like King Arthur or Robin Hood, and that's why he was integrated into the biblical tale of Goliath. Ancient Stone Artifacts Controversial cave discoveries are suggesting that humans reached North America far earlier than previously imagined. Archaeologists working in a cave in central Mexico found evidence that humans occupied the area over 30,000 years ago. If true, this would mean people arrived on the continent 15,000 years earlier than what scientists currently believe. The discovery includes ancient stone tools, and the hypothesis is even backed up by data collected from other ancient sites. But even though these are facts, some are still skeptical, and this has led to much debate. What we do know is that the first humans into North America came from East Asia. Mainstream researchers are still adamant that they began arriving about 16,000 years ago. Other researchers think it could be as far back as 130,000 years ago. No matter which way you turn, the evidence is disputed. These newest discoveries are a bit harder to refute, though, considering at least 2,000 stone tools have been found inside the Mexican cave, and they all date from between 25,000 and 32,000 years. There are some missing pieces to this puzzle, that's for sure. The Ramseum The Ramseum is the burial temple dedicated to Ramses II. It was originally intended to be the mortuary temple of the great king when he died, but it was also a temple dedicated to Amun. And even though we know it as the Ramseum, the Egyptians actually called it the house of millions of years of user Matre Seten Pere that unites Thebes the city in the domain of Amun. And let's be honest, that's too much of a title for anyone. The Ramseum is one impressive temple. It's absolutely huge. Many of the statues have since been broken or destroyed, and yet the temple still stands against time, even though it was built thousands of years ago. Its outer walls are decorated with depictions of military triumphs and old Egyptian gods. The controversy here is that some people believe these depictions show an ancient war against the Egyptians and a race of superior beings known as the Anunnaki. There is absolutely no proof that the Anunnaki even existed, which is why the theory is so controversial. From a purely scientific and archaeological standpoint, the Anunnaki were nothing but the gods worshipped by the old Mesopotamians, not beings from outer space that warred with the ancient world and mixed their alien blood with humans. The truth is that the depictions on the walls of the Ramseum are not showing Egyptians fighting alien gods, they show Egyptians fighting other humans and dedicating their victories to their own gods. The Golden Etruscan Orphic Book This book is considered to be the oldest book in the entire world. It is also one of the most mysterious books ever. The gold book is made of 24 karat gold, consisting of six sheets with text and illustrations. The illustrations depict a man riding a horse, a horse with deer horns, and a legendary creature that appears to be a griffin, with the head and wings of an eagle and the lower body of a lion. There is a mermaid, a harp, and soldiers. Written in the lost Etruscan language, the book is actually quite small, only about two inches in length, probably because it was made in such a valuable and expensive material. The gold manuscript was discovered inside of a tomb completely by accident while workers were digging out a canal in southern Bulgaria. At the time this book was made, over 2,000 years ago, around the year 600 BC, Bulgaria was largely occupied by the Thracians. But the book was written by the Etruscans, who migrated from Turkey to Italy about 3,000 years ago. 
The book probably made it to Thracian lands through trade before the Etruscans were wiped out and absorbed by the Romans in 400 BC. The quality is unparalleled in the world of ancient books and even artwork. Whoever made this amazing artifact was a very advanced goldsmith who used some of the most progressive techniques known to the Etruscans. Experts from both London and Sofia confirmed the book's authenticity. Even though similar gold pages have been found throughout the ancient world, according to Elka Penkova from the National History Museum in Sofia, this is the oldest remaining example of multiple pages being linked together to form a book from ancient times. The oldest home in history. In a cave in South Africa, archaeologists say they have found the earliest human home in history. Located in Vunderwerk Cave in the Kalahari Desert, Evidence shows that early humans were using the cave as a home over two million years ago. Modern humans didn't even exist that long ago, but our early ancestors found caves to be great homes. Researchers from the University of Toronto tested the cave sediments and found evidence of fire. Not only were early humans living in the cave that long ago, they were also making stone tools. But here is the really mysterious part. Archaeologists have never found a single scrap of human remains meaning no bones, no teeth, and no kind of biological evidence to suggest that humans have ever lived inside the cave. So how do researchers know that the place was occupied by humans if their bodies have never been found? The earliest evidence of humans using fire was found very deep inside the cave. Researchers found burned animal bones and the ashy remains of plants, suggesting the humans in this cave were the first to control fire for means of cooking. They also found traces of basalt sediment, something produced when a retreating glacier grinds against bedrock. They say the sediment probably got tracked into the cave by the humans living inside it. Of course, it's important to note that when I say humans, I don't mean like us. These were not humans as we know them, but our very, very ancient relatives. But definitely not apes, because they were able to make fire and use it in an organized way. These are the missing links that separate us humans from the great apes. Mysterious Gold Crown a rare and mysterious gold crown believed to be over 2,000 years old was recently discovered inside of a rotting cardboard box underneath an elderly man's bed in England. This story is as strange as it sounds. First, the elderly man has requested to remain anonymous. He doesn't want any trouble to come from owning one of the most valuable ancient crowns in existence. He apparently inherited the crown from his grandfather and put it away, forgetting about it over the years. When he decided to root through some of his old stuff, he came upon the gold wreath. It is still perfectly preserved after being around since basically the time of Alexander the Great. The wreath, or crown, it can be called both, was used in the days of ancient Greece to crown artists and athletic superstars during competitions. It was also used in religious ceremonies. And according to the auctioneers who are about to put the ancient relic up for sale, it should be worth more than $200,000. The auctioneer charged with getting the most out of this mysterious wreath, a man named Guy Schwing, says the artifact probably came from the Hellenistic period, between 323 BC and 31 BC, though it's incredibly difficult to properly date this kind of thing. It was probably made in northern Greece. Its composition is pure gold, and at the time it would have been hammered and molded into shape by a blacksmith. But the real mystery here is how this guy's grandfather got a hold of a perfectly preserved artifact worth so much money. He never told his grandson, and now we have no way of knowing where it came from. Papyrus Oxyrhynchus 90 When it comes to confusing ancient codes, there isn't anything quite like a manuscript known as Papyrus Oxyrhynchus 90, or P. Oxy 90 for short. Sounds kind of like the workout program, right? But not quite. It was found in the Egyptian city of Oxyrhynchus, written sometime between 179 and 180, and believed to be a simple receipt written in Greek for the payment of wheat. At its core, this small manuscript written on papyrus is very simple, but it also holds a great mystery. Nobody knows who the author was, and the final two lines of the manuscript have never been translated into any modern language. Nobody knows what they say. The rest of the receipt is Greek, but these two final lines are some kind of demotic writing and possibly a cryptogram. The truth is that nobody knows why the last two lines are so mysterious. They should be completely boring texts related to someone's wheat receipt, and yet they appear to be as cryptic as it comes. Mysterious Amphipolis Tomb 
The Ministry of Culture in Greece confirmed that the entrance to a secret underground room was found underneath the vast burial site of the Amphipolis tomb. This tomb comes from the era of Alexander the Great, and for the longest time, archaeologists feared they would never discover the secret of who was buried inside. But after discovering the hidden underground vault, some very interesting revelations have been brought to light. First of all, whoever's remains were hidden inside the ancient tomb have been guarded by a pair of sphinx sculptures for about 2,000 years. The tomb and its many chambers date back to between 325 and 300 BC. So far, all clues point to the tomb belonging either to the wife or mother of Alexander the Great. Experts say everything about it hints that it was intended for a very important woman. Some experts believe, however, that it was intended for his friend, Hephaestion, not his wife or mother. Before this find, experts had found three chambers and thought the third was the last, but since it was empty, it had probably already been looted over the many years it's been abandoned. Unfortunately, this ancient, very mysterious tomb has yet to be completely excavated. Archaeologists are hoping to open it to visitors in 2022, but there has never been confirmation of who was buried there. The research team is on the lookout for a throne or a marble case where a golden urn may have been placed that might give us some answers. The oldest map ever. There is a stone slab that was crafted in the Bronze Age that appears to depict the oldest map ever found in Europe. The stone map was pretty broken when discovered, with the large upper piece of it missing. Made on a slab of stone about 9 feet long and 6 feet wide, it dates back from sometime between 2150 and 1600 BC. Found in 1900 in France, it shows a known territory that researchers were able to understand. After the stone map was found, it was acquired by the National Archaeological Museum of France and stored there until researchers discovered it stuffed in the cellar in 2014. Dr. Clement Nicholas from Bournemouth University took an interest in the slab and began to study it. What Dr. Clement found was that the stone shows many elements of a prehistoric map, such as lines and repeated motifs. It was soon discovered that the piece of stone had been purposely shaped three-dimensionally in an attempt to replicate the valley of the River Odette, with lines trying to show the extensive network of rivers. It was a map of its creator's area. What scientists don't know is why the map was created. It could have been somebody's doodle. It could have been a strategic plan. Maybe someone trying to draw a map of the territory to control more land. Either way, it's 4,000 years old the oldest cartographical representation of any territory in Europe, and a total mystery. Old Bronze Mirrors Have you ever wondered how long people have been able to see their reflection? Archaeologists working to excavate a cemetery in China discovered around 80 very curious mirrors that have been dated back 2,000 years. According to the head of the archaeological team, Zhu Yingpei, ancient humans were casting mirrors using a large variety of different methods. Because the collection of mirrors was found to be so complete, many of them are still able to reflect images as if they were brand new. It's believed that the mirrors were meant to bring life and light into the darkness of the tomb. Thanks to the Silk Road, bronze mirrors became more popular, and the designs were inspired by art from other parts of the world, including India, Persia, and Egypt. Because of all the different crafting methods, the mirrors range in size from around 3 to 9 inches. They were inlaid with jade and turquoise and designed only for the elite by skilled artisans. Inside the actual graves, archaeologists found men and women buried with their mirrors tucked close to their heads or to their upper bodies. And even more fascinating is that the mirrors were found to be inscribed with hopes of a better future in the afterlife. For example, some phrases said eternal joy, others said long memory, and some even said family wealth. If these phrases sound familiar, that's because they are. 2,000 years later, people are still using similar inspirational or meaningful phrases on social media posts. The tombs here probably belong to elite members of the Han, but scientists still aren't entirely sure about the meaning attached to the mirrors. Perhaps there is more meaning in being able to see your own reflection thousands of years ago. People have always wanted to look good, and having a mirror helps. They probably meant much more to people than just being pretty and wishing people luck in the afterlife. Oldest Mexican Tomb Archaeologists working in southern Mexico found the remnants of a tomb that dates back 2,700 years, and professionals are saying that it could be the oldest burial of its kind ever performed in Mesoamerica. The tomb contains the body of a man who had been buried with jade and obsidian artifacts, ceramic vessels, and other grave goods. 
Archaeologist Emiliano Gallaga says the tomb dates back to between 500 and 700 BC, or about 2,500 years ago. There were also earlier burials, but experts say that this is the earliest example of an important person being buried inside of a pyramid, and of a pyramid being used as a tomb rather than a religious site or a religious temple. Back then, the pre-Hispanic cultures constructed pyramids to mimic the universe as they knew it, with levels leading from the underworld all the way into the heavens. At the highest part of the pyramid was almost always a temple, but not at this pyramid, which was found in the state of Chiapas, built by the Soque Indians. It's about 1,000 years older than the pyramid tomb at the archaeological site of Palenque. The man buried here was probably the ruler of the area. He was interred inside of a stone chamber at the bottom of a small pyramid. But as of right now, archaeologists don't know exactly who the man buried here was, if the pyramid had anything to do with the Maya or the ancient Olmecs, or why they moved from normal burials to placing bodies under pyramids. Baby in a Jar In Israel, the body of a baby has been found buried inside of a jar, and nobody knows why. Archaeologists were shocked when they discovered the ancient jar, which dates back to 3,800 years old, and saw the skeleton of a baby inside. One of the theories is that the ancient people thought babies were so fragile that they needed to be protected by the environment, even when deceased, so they put them in a jar, perhaps meant to represent the womb. It's a commendable idea, but not one that has ever been confirmed. We don't know why people buried infants in jars, but we do know that they did it all the way from the Bronze Age to the dawn of the 20th century. This particular baby in a jar burial was found in the ancient city of Jaffa, one of the earliest port cities on the planet. It has been continuously occupied since the year 900 BC. As part of the excavation, archaeologists also found coins from the Crusaders, the remains of two horses, and 232 seashells, probably gathered from the nearby Mediterranean Sea. Genghis Khan's Winter Home Genghis Khan lived from between 1162 to 1227 AD. He founded the second largest empire in the history of the planet, but when he wasn't busy leading the Mongols on a series of campaigns, he was hunkering down in his winter home. Up until now, nobody knew where this mysterious winter home was. But now researchers from Australian National University believe they have discovered the mysterious location of the Great Khan's winter hideout. Scientists use soil samples from Avraja, an ancient site that has yielded little in the way of physical evidence, located near the Avraja River, to determine that the place was occupied throughout the time that Genghis Khan was alive, as well as with his son after his death. The experts at the university are now saying that he probably made his camp at this place by the river for spring and winter, and that it was probably the main base camp before the Mongol Empire pushed south into the Yuan Empire of China. This site was largely abandoned after the 14th century. The only things archaeologists have found have been leftover bones, and as for the great Genghis Khan's actual burial tomb, it has still never been found. But discovering the place he once called home is definitely a great first step in trying to track down the final resting place of the Khan of Khans. Thanks for watching! Which of these mysterious discoveries did you find the most compelling? Which one do you want to learn more about? Let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe! See you next time! Bye!